Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar produced by Machine Design, New Equipment Digest, EHS Today, and Plant Services. Our topic today is applying ISO 13849 functional safety to machines in the USA, sponsored by Smersel. I'm Bob Vavra with Endeavor's Design and Engineering Group. Let's talk about how you can participate in our presentation today. If you have any technical issues during our session, simply type your issue into the Ask a Question box and a member of our team will assist you. You can also click on the question mark help button on the upper right corner of your screen. We also welcome your questions during our event today and we'll get to as many of those as we can during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. So feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your question into the Ask a Question box and click on the send button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Machine Design, New Equipment Digest, EHS Today, and Plant Services websites within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. So we're really happy to help our speaker today on this very important topic. Devin Murray is the Technicum Service Manager for Schmersel's Engineering Services Group in North America. He's written a number of safety standards and general machine guarding, conducted risk assessments and validations, and developed and reviewed the implementation of corporate safety standards. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and an MBA from Alfred University, home of the Saxons. And he's a TUV certified functional safety engineer for machinery. So Devin, safety is a prime topic for all of us. It's essential to outstanding manufacturing. So we're really interested in today's presentation. Thanks for joining us. Perfect, thank you so much, Bob. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. Uh, um, so Bob told you uh, who I am. <laughs> so we can jump right into uh, the content here. Um, here's the agenda. We have a lot of information to, to discuss within this hour. Um, I want to go over a, a brief overview of ISO 13849, and I want to emphasize the word brief. Um, this standard alone can have, you know, a one-day training session, which, you know, still might not be enough. Um, but training courses for ISO 13849 can range from, you know, four to five days um, just on this where we look at, you know, theory and, and the practical portion of it. So. I have an hour and ISO 13849, uh, as far as what it is, is just a, you know, a part of this webinar. So we're gonna do a brief overview of that standard, look at the different elements behind performance levels. Um, then we'll look into how that relates to the machines here in the US, um, even Canada. And we look at that as, you know, if we're a machine builder or end user, what does ISO 13849 mean to us? And then, we'll look at how to apply the standard. Um, and then we'll look at some misconceptions uh, rather around the standard itself, okay? Um, at the end, if time permits, uh, we'll do a Q&A. And um, as Bob mentioned, you know, if for any reason we don't have time to answer the questions and uh, your emails are captured and we will be sure to uh, reach out to you to answer any of the questions that you may have. Uh, so with that, Let's jump right into the actual uh, the content. And with this, uh, whenever I do any type of uh, presentations or, or trainings, I like to look at the standard, tell you what it is, what it means, um, and, and black and white, right? And then go into some more information about it, right? Actually dissect what is trying to say so that we can you know understand it a little better so here we, we see the the definition of functional safety uh, and this definition is taken from the safety standard IEC 61508 which is the the general requirements for functional safety essentially and the definition states that part of the overall safety relating to the EUC or equipment under control and the equipment under control system that depends on the correct functioning of the electrical, electronic and programmable electronic safety related systems and other risk reduction measures is what functional safety is. <laughs> okay, and again, that's the definition. What exactly does that mean? 
So essentially, uh, functional safety is the ability or the reliability of the machine to uh, effectively deliver its safety functions, right? So we have a, maybe a guard door interlock and we open up the guard door and the machine stops, right? That's the safety function. Functional safety is, is that safety function going to operate, all right? Um, now, again, this definition comes from IEC 61508. And there's been a lot of other standards that, you know, built off of this concept. So there's safety standards for functional safety that deals with process engineering. Okay, there's standards for functional safety that deals with uh, nuclear applications. And of course, there are standards for functional safety for machinery. Um, one of those standards for functional safety for machinery is ISO 13849. And that standard will bring in the idea of what's called a performance level. And again, here's the definition for that. The definition for a performance level is a discrete level used to specify the ability of, of safety related parts of control systems to perform a safety function under foreseeable conditions. Again, what does that mean <laughs> to us, right? So when we look at ISO 13849, it essentially looks at how reliable is your safety function. And based on how reliable that is, it will describe or, or categorize a performance level as performance levels A, B, C, D, or E, where A is the, the lowest performance level you can have for your safety function and E being the highest. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But when you look at these definitions, they almost sound alike, which they should because again, performance levels is derived from the IEC 61508, which deals with functional safety, okay? Uh, now, performance levels. Again, they range from performance levels A through E. And again, we're gonna do a brief overview, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, and for, if you were, you know, if you know of ISO 13849 already or been introduced to it, hopefully this will be a, a refresher for you. Um, and maybe another way to actually understand what this standard is trying to say. And if this is the first time that you're ever, you know, being introduced to performance levels, um, I'm going to, again, try to make sure that we can understand exactly what this standard is trying to tell us um, by looking at some practical examples, okay? So a performance level is made up of, of four different elements. And that first element is going to be the category, okay? A category is the physical wiring of your safety circuit. And this can range from a category B, one, two, three, or four. Okay, this is the physical wiring. And when we look at the, the block diagrams from ISO 13849, uh, we see here you know, a, a block diagram of a, a single channel system. All right, where your safety function will be uh, categorized as input logic output, which is the ILO blocks, um, and then some interconnected means, so the IM, and that interconnected means can be electrical wiring, okay, some type of you know, optical connection, but it's just how they all connect to each other, okay. Uh, for category B, it's basic, and you have just you know, an on-off switch going to a ice cube relay, category B, basic. Uh, then you can have a category one, which is also single channel, but now you're using well-tried principles and components. So you're using a, a safety-rated device going to a, you know, mechanically linked contactor, right? Well-tried principles and components. Then you can have a category two, which now brings in the idea of a test function or TE in the example here for test equipment. Um, in between that single channel and the test equipment, you see that letter M for monitoring. So now we bring in the idea of monitoring for a category two system. Um, and that OTE is the, the output from that test equipment, 
Okay, but again, practical, what does it mean for us, right? So now we have a single channel system, again, a safety rated switch going to a mechanically linked contactor, but now we have some type of monitoring to detect for a, a, a failure. Okay, then you can have a category three or four. And now we see here, this brings in the idea of redundancy. So we have a two channel system, okay? In between the two channel system, you see the letter C for cross monitoring. And we look at a category three, that's gonna be a, a dual channel system that's resistant against a single fault, uh, that's gonna prevent the next machine cycle if a, a failure is detected. And we look at you know, North American requirements, we look at the idea of a control reliable circuit. That's very similar to what's being called up by a category three safety circuit, okay? Category four, still redundant in monitoring, but now we have the idea of fault accumulation and being able to maintain safety, all right? So again, going back to what we're looking at, category, this is how we are physically wiring up our safety circuit. How are you taking that safety component and how are you tying it to a safety controller, safety PLC, for example? Okay, that's the physical wiring, that's the categories in a nutshell. Performance levels also look at something called diagnostic coverage, all right? When we look at diagnostic coverage, we're looking at the ability for the safety system to detect a failure. And as we look at this, I want you to remember the definition that we saw in the, in the first slide about what uh, functional safety is and what performance levels are, right? Being able to have the safety function perform the way it's supposed to. In order to do that, we have to do some, some uh, calculations. And now we see you know, the first elements of functional safety, okay? So now we have to actually do some calculations to prove the safety function can perform the way it's supposed to. And one of those calculations and one of those parameters is diagnostic coverage. Um, for this, for the diagnostic coverage, we're looking at detected failures. Okay, so what type of dangerous failures can be detected? And in order to come up with this idea of this diagnostic coverage, um, you can do a, you know, a, a failure mode and effects analysis, right, FMEA. Uh, but this standard does give some guidance as far as looking at some, some ratios of detected failures versus all failures within the system, dangerous failures. And you do the math and then you come up with uh, a percentage, right? Because again, these are ratios. And the standard says, all right, if you have a diagnostic coverage where you can detect a dangerous failure less than 60%, then you have none, <laughs> you have no diagnostic coverage. If you can uh, detect from 60 to 89%, it's considered low, 90 to 99 is considered medium, and then 99 is considered high. Okay, again, brief overview, <laughs> okay? And we'll come back to some of this a little later. Um, in addition to diagnostic coverage, uh, we also look into mean time to dangerous failure. Right, in the previous slide, again, trying to, be, trying to bring it back to something that we can relate. Um, the idea of diagnostic coverage, being able to detect failures, well, a safety controller, right? A safety PLC, those detect errors in the system, detect failures in the system, and that's one way to do that. Um, mean time to dangerous failure, our third parameter that we're looking at for performance level. Uh, devices, safety devices are designed to fail to safe, but that's the requirement of a safety device. It must fail to safe. However, a safety device can fail in a dangerous state. Okay, Murphy's Law, right? It, it can fail in a dangerous state. Again, that definition, functional safety, performance levels, right? Can this safety function react the way it's supposed to during foreseeable conditions and faults and errors and, and dangerous failures are foreseeable conditions, right? So we wanna make sure that we are creating a safety function to withstand against certain failures. Dangerous failures is being one of them. And when we look at components that have wear and tear, right? Um, a limit switch, electrical mechanical limit switch. Um, an electrical mechanical key switch where there's a key going into a cam mechanism, 
Okay, that has wear and tear. We have to do some calculations to determine how often are we really using this device? Based off that, we can determine what's considered a mean time to a dangerous failure, okay? Because again, a safety device can fail and it should fail to safe and we should have mechanisms, mechanisms in place to detect that failure. But this whole idea behind functional safety and ISO 13849 is what happens if there's a dangerous failure? Can we still maintain safety? So again, we introduced some formulas, all right, going back again, that functional safety, can we prove this out? Can we prove that our safety system will, will function the way it's supposed to when we need it? So we look at these devices that have the wear and tear and we have to do a calculation. The first one is NOP for number of operations. All right, so we say, okay, well, how many days out the year are we gonna use this machine? How many hours out the day are we gonna use this machine? And a T-cycle is, well, how often are we opening up the guard door? How often are we calling upon the safety function to actually operate? Okay, so we have to do this, this calculation for a number of operations, and then we plop it into the formula on the right to determine what our mean time to dangerous failure is for this component, okay? Again, there's some more behind that, but as a 10,000 foot view, maybe it's 5,000 foot view maybe for uh, understanding the elements of our performance levels, that's how far I wanna go, okay? And of course, if you have any questions, let me know. But I don't want to go too far into the weeds here um, because this whole presentation is not on how to calculate performance levels, okay? But I want to introduce you to those elements, okay? So we have categories, diagnostic coverage, mean time to dangerous failures. The last thing is common cause failures. And when we look at category two, what brings in the idea of a test function, right? Um, categories three and four, we have redundancy, two channels, we want to make sure that there aren't going to be any failures, any, any errors in our system that's going to result in the loss of both channels. So the standard will give a set of procedures, uh, I believe it's eight procedures, and each procedure will be given a score. And the goal is to select enough procedures to get a score of 65 or more to say that our safety system is resistant against a common cause failure. Okay, some examples of procedures from the standard would be uh, separation between signal paths. Okay, you do that, you get you can claim 15 points. Uh, component diversity, so you know, normally open and a normally closed contact, or a non-contact read sensor and a electrical mechanical limit switch on the door. Okay, so two different types of devices. So some type of component diversity. Um, well tried components and training, right? So you're using a safety component, you understand the concepts behind ISO 13849, you can claim five points for each of those. Okay, so again, you have to do enough to say, okay, we have 65 or more and we're resistant against this, uh, a common cause failure, all right? Those are the different elements that create a performance level. Next, I wanna show you how they all actually do that, <laughs> okay? And again, as we do this, I wanna keep referring back to that definition of functional safety, performance levels. Is this system gonna react the way it's supposed to? And all we're doing is trying to prove that out, okay? To show that in more detail, we're gonna look at a table from the standard, okay? The standard will show us those performance levels, A, B, C, D, and E. And this table is gonna explain how to get there, all right? A performance level is essentially the probability of dangerous failures per hour, okay? And I'll, I'll explain how they how they combine in a second, but that's what a performance level is, the probability of dangerous failures per hour. Okay, how do we get there? So on this table, we see that uh, there's some bars and those bars will represent the mean time to dangerous failures as we saw on the previous slide. 
Um, we saw on the previous slide that there can be a low, medium, or high. All right, and here we show that um, anywhere between three to nine years is considered low in mean time to dangerous failures. Uh, 10 to 29 is medium, 30 to 100 is something that's considered high. All right. Um, then we see here on the y axis, uh, the x axis, we see that we have categories. Uh, so categories B, one, categories twos, threes, and fours that we described already. We see that there's diagnostic coverages, and you can have, again, none, low, medium, or high, as we discussed. And then you can have uh, common cause failures where you need to get a score of 65 or more. And again, that's reserved for category twos and above because category B and category one is single channel. Where there's this no room for a common cause failure because one failure and your system is lost. Right? There's no monitor in there, there's not a dual channel. So common cause failures don't make sense for category B and one. On the other axis here, what we show from the standard is the probability of dangerous failures per hour. Okay, again, that's from the standard. What does that mean to us? <laughs> what does that mean? So here we see, okay, something times 10 to the minus four. And then all the way down to as low as something as 10 to the minus eight. What those are, are a failure, a dangerous failure in your system. Okay. So the range between 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minus, I can't see that five, <laughs> is performance level A. And at the bottom end of the spectrum there, performance level E can have perform uh, anything times 10 to the minus eight and below. Okay, those are pretty low numbers. But the question is exactly how low is that? <laughs> okay, well, how, how low are we talking 10 to the minus eight? To do that, to explain that, again, something more practical to us. So this table will say, okay, we need to get to a performance level C, for example, okay? Based off this table from the standard, we can get to a performance level C by using a category one safety circuit and using devices that have a high mean time to dangerous failure. And we can get there without having any diagnostic coverage because there's no monitoring for a category one. Okay, so that's how you can use this table from the standard. What performance level do you need? A, B, C, D, or E. And with this table, we can determine how to get there. What type of components do we need? You know, low, medium, or high, mean times dangerous failure. What type of category do we need to design to? Category B through four. What diagnostic coverage do we need? Low, medium, or high. And do we need to take into account common cause failures? Okay. Now, something times 10 to the minus eight. What does that mean to us? Okay, so for this, I want to look at an example of the lottery. Okay, let's look at the probability of winning the jackpot. And if we show the rules here for this, this lottery, uh, we have to select six numbers out of 49 numbers. Okay, six unique numbers out of 49 numbers to win the jackpot. And if we, we do the math, we see that there are just under 14 million different combinations, all right? The chances of us selecting the correct six numbers, all right, the probability of that happening is 7.2 times 10 to the minus eight, okay? Something times 10 to the minus eight. Well, that is equivalent to performance level E. All right, so what does that mean? The probability of having a dangerous failure within a system that's designed to a PLE is similar to winning the jackpot, okay? So can you win the jackpot, right? In theory, you, you can. Um, if you're on this call or if you're gonna listen to the recorded session, chances are you have not won the jackpot, but can you win the jackpot? You 
essentially can in theory. So if you design a safety system to a PLE, can you have a dangerous failure where you lose your safety system? You can, but the chances are so slim, it's similar to you winning the lottery jackpot, right? It's probably not going to happen, <laughs> okay? Can it happen? Yes, but we've done enough procedures, enough measures where the chances are minimum, okay? That's what a performance level is, the probability of a dangerous failure, all right? How do we wire these circuits up, categories, right? While we look at the common cause failures, diagnostic coverages, means time to dangerous failure, all of this to go back to that definition of functional safety. Is this safety system going to react the way it's supposed to, even under a foreseeable fault condition? Okay. Now, we have a little understanding, hopefully, of performance levels, right? What that, what this looks like, again, at a 10,000, maybe even 5,000 foot view. These are for safety functions, all right? Functional safety and performance levels in particular are for safety functions. And we go back to our standard here, ISO 13849, and they will give us the, the definition of a safety function. And here we see a safety function is the function of the machine whose failure can result in an immediate increase of the risk. All right, so here we see a, a machine. And I wanna point out the safety functions. All right, what on here is a safety function? The standard actually provides some explanation of what a safety function is. But based off of this example in this machine, we see that there's some present sentient devices, right? There's some light curtains, some scanners. Uh, there's an enable device, a handheld enable device, a, a foot pedal. Uh, there's an e-stop. An e-stop is a safety function. Maybe there's uh, some safe speed monitoring. That is a safety function. So we look at these safety functions and we say, okay, for these safety functions, what is going to be the performance level requirement? How do I need to wire up these, these, these safety functions? Do I need to achieve a performance level A, B, C, D, or E in order to fulfill these requirements of functional safety? And we wanna, we wanna make sure again, these, these light curtains react the way it's supposed to, the e-stop react the way it's supposed to, okay? So these are for safety functions, all right? Okay, so that is ISO 13.9 in performance levels. All right, again, a brief introduction. The next question is, what does that mean to us? <laughs> okay, so, you know, I just spent, you know, 20 something minutes talking about this international standard. What does that mean for me as a machine builder here in the States or me as an end user here in the States, right? So to answer that question, I first want to really quickly go over the structure of a safety standard. And then this will help me explain why we even care about performance levels, okay? So a safety standard can be broken up into uh, three different types, all right? Type A is a basic safety standard, and it gives you just general concepts and designs revolving around machine safety, right? Real basic. Uh, ISO 12100 is a basic safety standard, right, for, for risk assessments, okay? Uh, type B looks at particular aspects of safety, whether you're looking at a safety device, okay? So an e-stop has to fulfill a specific safety standard for e-stops. Um, you know, safety mat, two-hand controls, those have their own type B safety standard. Um, and there's also different aspects of safety for, for guarding, for example there's a standard that will let us know how high and how far we need to be with the hard guard. That is a type B standard. And then lastly, there's a type C standard, which looks at requirements for a particular machine. Okay, so some machines have a type C standard where the standard looks at general hazards and requirements that help safeguard that particular machine. Okay, now, 
if we look at some standards that are relevant here in America, we have ANSI B110, which we are probably all familiar with on the call, right? That's for safety of machines. That standard does reference control, uh, control systems, performing a safety function. Going back to our definitions of functional safety, it does reference categories, okay? And it references ISO 13849. Okay, uh, type B, again, a, a certain aspect of safety, ANSI B1119 and B1126. B1119 looks at risk reduction measures, all right? ANSI B1126 is specifically for functional safety. Both of these standards reference ISO 13849. Okay, ANSI B1119 references categories, right? And control systems performance safety functions. B1126 has been revised to closely uh, explain and, and, and be as close to as harmonized as possible to ISO 13849. Okay, type C for a particular type of machine, ANSI, PMMI, B151, uh, B151.1, for example. Um, looks at safety requirements. ANSI RA fifteen oh six for robots. Both of them reference ding ding ding, <laughs> right? Control systems performing the safety functions categories and ISO thirteen eight four nine. All right, so it's not just you know an international standard. Is this not something that's you know only European manufacturers have to worry about? No, it's within our North American requirements as well, or regulations as well, where if we are following these ANSI standards, they're calling out ISO 13849, okay? So yes, performance levels, functional safety is in fact relevant here for us in North America, all right? Now, the question is, how do we apply it? How do we apply it? We have a, a basic understanding of what it is. We see, okay, we kind of have to know what it is because it's being called out in ANSI, all right? How do we apply it? <laughs> right, that's the next question. What do we do with it? So when we look at a machine and we go through our you know, risk assessment process where the first thing is the hazard analysis, right? So we, we define the limits of the machine and we go through our hazard analysis, which is identifying the hazards. And the hazards are the potential sources of harm. Okay, that is the hazard. So we see this CNC machine and we can go through this risk assessment and we can say, okay, well, what is a potential hazard? All right, potential sources of harm. We have a rotating element. Okay, so we have a, a risk. The risk we can determine based off of any you know, methodology that we wanna use. Okay, any methodology you wanna use, but we have to determine, we have to quantify this risk associated with this hazard. Okay, for this example, you know, we could say, okay, we have the possibility of an amputation if we're exposed to this rotating element. Um, we can't avoid it, we are, um, accessing this this CNC machine every two hours. So for our entire shift is gonna be maybe frequent maybe. So we go through some arbitrary parameters. You can choose anything you wanna choose as far as your methodology for quantifying a risk, but we have to quantify it. And what, whatever methodology you wanna use, you're gonna to come to a conclusion to say, this hazard falls within some range, whether it's a, a low risk or something that's extreme or you know unacceptable okay and for you know this example we'll say okay we have this this hazard that we need to guard and maybe this hazard is considered high all right so we have the cnc machine we have this hazard this rotating element there's risk of amputation there's going to be a high risk hazard and we want to see okay what what can we do to to safeguard this hazard okay so 
we go through our hierarchy of control measures, as many of you know already, have seen before, right? We have a hazard. We want to see, can we eliminate it? Can we eliminate this hazard altogether? If we can't, can we substitute it? All right, if we can't substitute it, can we provide some type of engineering controls? If we can't provide engineering controls or more likely in addition to engineering controls, uh, can we add some administrative controls? All right, and also add in some PPE. Okay, so we go through our, our hierarchy of controls and, and a lot of times we, we can't eliminate the hazard Maybe we can substitute it, but again, that's depends. It all depends, right? If it's an if it's an existing machine, we probably can't eliminate. Probably probably can't substitute. But again, it all depends, right? It all depends. More than likely, though, we, we're going to look at some engineering controls. All right, engineering controls. What can we do to minimize the risk that is posed from this rotational hazard of this CNC machine? Well, we want to add some some hard guards, right? So we throw on a, a hard guard on the CNC machine. Perfect. All right. But you know what? We're going to need some some interaction, right? We're going to need to load a part or remove a part. So now we're going to need some type of a guard door interlock. Well, that guard door interlock is a safety function. Because we are introducing a safety function, we are now introducing performance levels because now we have to determine how reliable that guard or interlock must be all right so we want to add on an e-stop a light curtain and an enable device for some type of uh, mechanical operation or maintenance operation these are performance levels so now we have to determine what our performance level is going to be right functional safety and in order to determine what our performance level has to be, the standard will give us this decision tree. Okay, so based off the severity of injury, based off of the frequency of exposure, based off the possibility to avoid the hazard, and some of these are highly subjective, <laughs> right? The standard does give some guidance on, you know, when to use a F1 or F2 or P1 or P2. Uh, but we go through this decision tree to determine which performance level we need to design our safety circuit to. Okay, so for example, we say, okay, for this CNC machine, we'll have a, an S2, right? We can have a serious injury, amputation or more, an S2. Um, maybe we'll say for this process, for this CNC machine, maybe it's a F1. You know, maybe it's you know, one time a shift, we load a part in and, you know, the, the process takes, you know, several hours, six hours or whatever, right? So maybe it's an F1. And if we are exposed to the hazard, so we're loading the part in and we have an unintended startup, we can't avoid it. So we'll have a, a P2. So S2, F1, P2 will lead us to a requirement of PLD. All right. So that's what we need to do. Okay, how do we get there? We look at our table again, right? To get to a POD, what category do we want to uh, wire to? What diagnostic coverage? What type of devices can we have? What are the common cause failures we're going to select? All right, so this is where that chart comes into place. This is how it all ties back in together. So we want to add a control measure based off our risk assessment. Well, let's look at what performance level we need for that control function, right? that safety function. Okay, so we determine we need a POD. We then select some devices, right? A guard door interlock with some locking capability, dual channel monitoring, right? So we start designing our safety function. Okay. We look at everything that we started to look at at the beginning of this presentation, right? There's categories. Diagnostic coverage, mean time of dangerous failure, common cause failures. We do those calculations and we say, okay, is our performance level higher or equal than our performance level requirement? And if it is, perfect. Okay, if it's not, then we have to do some redesigns. <laughs> okay, but our performance level, what we actually desire, uh, designed and um, 
calculated has to be at or higher than the performance level requirement. I mean, that, that makes sense, right? Um, after you've designed and implemented this safety function, ISO 13849 then calls out validation. Okay, we have to validate. Again, going back to that definition, functional safety. Is this system going to work the way it's designed? So we have to actually test that out. We have to validate the safety function to say, yes, this safety function is going to react the way it's supposed to if we introduce a fault, okay, a dangerous condition that the system has been designed to withstand. So we have to validate it, okay? So that's how it, it kind of relates all together. All right, and again, this is a, a lot of different elements, <laughs> right, that we, that we try to tie together um, within this short amount of time to talk about these performance levels, okay, and how do they relate to, to what's here in the States and when do we use them, how do we use them, okay? Um, I next want to go into a couple of uh, misconceptions and then, of course, um, have some time for some uh, Q&A because this, this standard, this topic, generally generates a lot of questions, all right? This was introduced uh, 2010, I believe. And at that time when this standard was introduced, there were a lot of questions, right? The industry was not ready for this standard because you're looking at safety and now you're saying, okay, well, let's start doing some calculations to determine how safe your system is, right? And you know, we looked at the, the formula for diagnostic coverage, the formula for MTTFD, right? The industry was not ready for this standard. And fast forward, you know, 13, 14 years later, there's still a lot of questions. This standard has now been incorporated into our North American ANSI standards. There's still a lot of questions. And as you can see, you know, based off this short presentation, you know, this 40, 45 minute presentation, there's a lot of elements behind it, right? So again, just want to give you an overview of what that is and, and to help hopefully explain why we even care about this particular standard and, and the elements within it, okay? Um, so some, some misconceptions. Uh, the first thing is performance levels are for an entire machine. That's a misconception, right? So as a end user talking to a machine builder, right? And you, you, you may say, we want to have the safest machine possible, okay? Machine builder, I don't care what you do for your other customers. We want the safest machine possible. So please design this machine to be performance level E, okay? That doesn't apply okay a machine itself cannot be a certain performance level performance levels are reserved for safety functions so you can say i want all my safety functions on this machine to be a ple you can you can say that um i wouldn't recommend saying that right you would definitely want to do a risk assessment to determine you know what performance levels you need to be at um but performance levels are reserved for safety functions not for an entire machine the reason behind that is because certain safety functions may require a higher performance levels than others right again we looked at how often are uh, we being exposed to the hazard, right? The severity of the hazard. So on, on a machine, there are you know, gonna be multiple different hazards, multiple different risks, and you may have uh, different control measures, a hard guard here and a hard guard there, a light curtain over here, okay? And based off how you interact with that machine, how you interact with those potential hazards and risks will determine the performance levels for those particular safety functions. So one performance level may be a uh, performance level B, you know, on the back of the machine. And at the front of the machine for the operation may require a performance level D, okay? So it all depends on the safety function. It all depends on the risk assessment, okay? Um, next misconception. 
Electrical mechanical components cannot uh, be used for performance levels. Okay, so um, within the industry, right, a lot of safety manufacturers are, you know, moving to electrical devices, right? And when we look at ISO 13849 trying to achieve category four performance level E, um, yes, electrical de electronic devices, probably the easiest way to get there. Okay, straight to the point. However, that does not mean that electrical mechanical devices cannot get there because they can. So you can use electrical mechanical devices and still achieve the highest performance level available, which is a PLE category four. Okay, it depends, of course, how you wire it up, right? It depends on you know, that the mean time to dangerous failure component, right? Again, these are wear and tear components. So how often are we utilizing this device? What is going to be our diagnostic coverage? Are we able to implement, you know, uh, that diversity with the switches at that guard door, for example? So there's a, there's a lot that, as we've seen already, there's a lot that uh, goes behind performance levels. Um, but electrical mechanical components, they can get there. Okay, so they are still you know, relevant for machine safety, even when we dive into the world of functional safety. Okay. Um, the next one, performance levels should be applied to existing safety functions. Okay, existing safety functions. This is a misconception, okay? Performance levels are used for new safety functions. And part of the reason is because we're looking at the probability of a dangerous failure. So we're looking at, you know, best guesstimations on usage, right? How often are we using this safety function? How often are we calling upon this, this limit switch to actuate? This is for new safety functions. And if we dive deeper into the standard, we will see a calculation for, you know, when we should change out this device for a preventative measure. So we do some calculations for a, a mean time to a dangerous failure, which is years, and we do an additional calculation and the standard would say, okay, well, maybe in six years, we should replace this device. Well, we really can't do that on a, on a safety function that's been in service for 20 years, 10 years, two years, okay? Remember safety functions. So can you apply performance levels to an existing machine? Yes, because if you have an existing machine and you are doing an upgrade, okay, and you're gonna introduce a new safety function or modify that safety function, then yes, you can apply ISO 13849 performance levels to that new safety function on that old machine, <laughs> okay? So for, for performance levels, we're looking at new safety functions, new safety functions on brand new machines and new safety functions on old machines, okay? Um, I think one more misconception. Yes, the last one we have. Um, we do all those calculations, okay? And we say, okay, our performance level is where it needs to be. And um, actually this should be, the PL is greater than or equal than, yes, uh, than the PLR, <laughs> okay? So you, did all, you do all your calculations, your performance level is at or higher than your PLR, your performance level requirement, everything is done, right? Wrong, right? Because this is part of the misconceptions <laughs> seg segment here. So that's not quite true. Everything you did is great, but you're not done yet. You're almost done. Why? Because ISO 13849 is a two-part standard, <laughs> okay? ISO 13849-1 is everything that we spoke about, right? The, the uh, performance level requirement, decision uh, tree, uh, all the parameters behind it, all the calculations, to get to a performance level, that's all ISO 13849-1. To fulfill 
ISO 13849, you also have to look at dash two, which is for validation. Validation, we have to prove that this system that you have designed and yes, even calculated, can actually perform the way it's supposed to. Functional safety, right? Going back to that first definition, is can the city function react the way it's supposed to even under foreseeable conditions? Foreseeable conditions include, you know, some fault conditions. So we introduce those fault conditions. Okay, that's a lot. A lot of information. I warned you, right? We had a lot of information to get over, get, get through. Um, I I did want to leave some time for questions, and I think we do have time, and we have a lot of questions that came through. <laughs> we do, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to a great presentation, uh, Devin. We're looking forward to getting into those questions here in just a moment. Uh, if you'd like to submit a question, type it into the Ask a Question box and hit the Send button. And also we'd ask you to take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. So we've, you know, as we mentioned, we've got a lot of questions from the audience. Let's start with this, a uh, couple of these. Is there a scenario where it would be preferable to choose a lower performance level over a higher performance level? Or is it okay to always err toward using the highest performance level available? Um, so there's, there's never anything wrong with, um uh designing upwards right so if you need a performance level b there's nothing wrong with you know uh designing and implementing performance level c d or e okay um now as, as far as which one to use you, you really need to go through your decision tree right your s f and p or your risk assessment to determine which one you really need um and again, like I mentioned in the presentation, you can you can say to a machine builder, I want all my city functions to be PLD or PLE. And there's gonna be a lot behind that on, on making sure that each one of those city functions can get to a PLE. And of course, that's gonna involve more time, more design, which equates to what? More money, <laughs> right? Can it be done? Yes, but. Um, that's not necessarily the case, right? So you definitely want to determine what performance level you need. Um, and then if you want to design higher than that, you can, but you definitely want to see what you need as a minimum first. Very good. Um, here's another question. Beyond the validation of the safety function, are there requirements in the safety standard for safety function covering pre preventive maintenance and testing? Um, yeah, so that will be in, in dash two as well. Um, in addition to the validations, um, I, I kind of briefly mentioned too, there's also a, a calculation within dash one where you actually calculate when you should replace a safety device, okay? And again, going back to the idea of a, a mean time to a dangerous failure. So those devices that have that wear and tear you do the calculations and it may say, you know, we want to replace this device within 10 years. And, you know, you put it inside your, your PM schedule and 10 years come and that device works fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But calculations and probability says that we want to replace it because we are approaching that that curve where we can have a dangerous failure. So, so yeah, maintenance is even taken into account um, and, and testing for, for these safety functions. Absolutely. Um, question is, is, is the interlock a safety device or a safety function? Oh, okay. So an, int, uh, an, inter, an interlock, a safety interlock is a safety device. Okay. Safety interlock is a safety device itself. Um, that safety interlock device can be part of a safety function and that safety function can be an interlock function, right? And an interlock function brings the machine to an interlock state. Okay, so it kind of uh, depends on how you're using it, but you know, a, a light curtain is a safety device. But when you attach a light curtain to a safety controller and a VFD, for example, you have created a safety function. And the same thing with that key to interlock, okay? So the safety function in that case, the 
the audience member suggested the safety function of that case would be stopping the machine. Correct. Correct. So if you open up the door or interrupt the light curtain, that safety function is going to stop the machine and bring that machine into an uh, interlock state. So which is where that whole term interlock comes from. This is, this is a philosophy question for you uh, <laughs> from the audience. For risk analysis, do we assume the worst probable, uh, worst possible severity or the most likely severity? That is a great question. Um, so we want to, this is honestly a combination of both, right? So you want to use the worst case scenario that's reasonable, foreseeable. Okay, and I always use the example that um, you can have a trip hazard and you can always talk that trip hazard up to a fatality, right? You trip, you can hit your head and you can have fatality, okay? Is that the case? It could be, right? But let's look at the actual situation. Is that something that's reasonable, foreseeable? So when we look at a, a hazard in our risk assessment, yes, we wanna look at the worst case scenario Keep in mind that we're looking at something that's reasonable, foreseeable. So, if worst case scenario is fatality, okay, fine, it's fatality. Is that reasonable, foreseeable on this robot cell? Yeah, maybe it is. Um, you know, on this, you know, this 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 bandsaw, is fatality reasonable, foreseeable? Maybe not. Amputation, sure. Fatality, maybe not. So, it kind of a combination of both. So, you look at the severity, but also keep in mind uh, reasonable, foreseeable. Okay. Another question. Do most uh, safety component suppliers supply the B10D valves or values? Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> yes. So every manufacturer that manufactures safety components, um, if, if their devices are being claimed to meet ISO 13849, they will provide a B10D value. And and for those who are not familiar with that, that's one of those values and one of the earlier calculations that I showed on the screen. Um, but even if the manufacturer does not provide that B10D value, uh, you can pull that from the standard. Um, in addition to that, every manufacturer that manufactures a, a safety rated limit switch, for example, they all will have the same B10D value for the contacts. And that's that's by design. So the standard made sure that you know manufacturers were not competing for safety based off of a safety standard, right? So um, every manufacturer will have the same B10D value for a particular device, which is why you can also find that B10D value within the standard itself. Very good. We of, talked a, a moment ago about uh, interlocks, and here's a kind of a parallel question regarding e-stops. Is this a safety device or a safety function? Uh, because the, the uh, viewers points out that e-stops don't add safety, but just provide a way to stop the machine when things go wrong. Yeah, so e-stops e are a, a definitely a secondary safety function, right? Um, something has gone wrong, right? So either uh, your primary safety function has failed, or someone's in danger, or one of the automation functions have failed. Uh, so you have to rely on this secondary safety function. And when you think about, all right, does performance levels, you know, do they do they also revolve around e-stops? And absolutely, right? Because again, we're saying that we have to use the e-stop in this emergency condition. And if we're worried about, you know, the right two channel design for a key switch. Well, you know, you better believe that we should be worried about the right two channel design for an e-stop, right? That's just that as a maybe even more important than the primary, depending on the application and how you look at it. Um, but yeah, so e-stops are you know, a secondary uh, safety function. We have time for a couple more here. Um, the, one of the viewers said, we just wanted to make sure, but is uh, performance levels applied to both old and new machines? Um, yes, old and new machines, but again, we're looking at the safety functions. So performance levels uh, are relative to old machines when we are implementing a new safety function. Okay, if that makes sense. So yes, they apply to old machines, but only when we are introducing a new safety function. 
Very good. And and one more here. Um, is there an online calculator for entering all the parameters uh, in order to make sure the performance level calculations uh, are faster or more more accurate? Uh, so yes, there is an online calculator uh, and it's free. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's called Sistema. And uh, you can download that and you can use it to uh, calculate your performance level. Um, I call it a, you know, glorified calculator. So it's kind of, you know, garbage in is garbage out. So you really have to understand the standards and the, the nuances behind, you know, some of these uh, formulas to actually, you know, input the right information. Um, but Sistema is a free software that, that um, you can download. Uh, manufacturers of safety components have libraries for their components. So you can drag and drop, um, you know, those V10 D values and MTGF D values for the components for the calculation. It's, it's a great tool if, um, again, if you understand the standard and, and know how to use it. That's uh, S-I-S-T-E-M-A, Systema, Systema. Very good. Well, we've got far more questions than we have time today, so we will be getting <laughs> to all of your questions uh, offline after uh, today's presentation. So I want to thank Devin for a, for a great presentation. And on behalf of Machine Design, New Equipment Digest, EHS Today, and Plant Services, I'd also like to thank Schmersel for sponsoring today's event. Of course, thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, and as, uh, as always, stay safe out there. Bye, everybody.